Since we are all professional developers here, I think that we can agree at the very beginning that if we have solved one thing in software development, if we have knocked down one thing at least, that is asynchronous programming. Right, maybe not. <laughs> so we can agree then that if we haven't solved one thing, if we have completely no idea how to do one thing in software development, that's asynchronous programming. And this is the premise of my talk today. We've been creating asynchronous and reactive apps for like ever, uh, because we have these great APIs that Apple has given us in the iOS SDK. Uh, notification center, closures, delegates, there's plenty of them. But the problem is that as your application gets more complex, it's likely that you will use most uh, and most probably all of these in the same application. And you know, code gets complicated. Um, you know, there's delegates and there's things being called, arbitrary times, race conditions, uh, and so forth. So it's a little bit more difficult in the cycle of life. And so actually, even very simple programs can suffer from the pains of asynchronous programming. For example, if we take an array, that's very simple, that's very nice, and we know how it works. You can just uh, loop over all the items, right? Really easily, because it's simple and it's synchronous, and you know how to do it. The problem is that you can synchronously loop over those items, but you're working with a piece of data that is frozen in time. You can't really, for example, account for items that are going to be added later on to that array. So you will say, well, why would I want to work with something that is just not there yet? Well, hold that thought. Um, imagine that this array drives a table view. Not an unseen thing. Um, and your networking layer grabs some new data from the cloud on a background thread and adds some more items to the array. Now you have a problem. Your UI does not reflect your data model anymore. So instead of creating your business logic, which is you know, the meat of your app, you have to start thinking about notifications or closures, you know, how to synchronize my UI, or how to synchronize my data layer across threads, and so forth. So you see, it's very natural that we would like to work not with static, frozen-in-time versions of our data models, but also with all the asynchronous updates that they receive over time. And um, Arc Swift addresses that very simply with a single class called Observable. And the Observable, what it does is to add a time dimension to your uh, data. So you don't work with a frozen piece of data and a very static snapshot that somebody took at a time, but you work with all the versions of your data, always with the latest, most current version of your piece of data. And so Observable is a class. And what it does is just to emit a new notification that carries the latest version of your data. So you start with, in our array example, we'll start with the first version of the, of the array, and then whenever somebody updates it, maybe from another thread or different class, uh, Observable will let us know and give us the latest version of that array. And whenever you change it again, well, another time you will get notified. You can use the latest, freshest version of your array. And you know these values that we plotted over the timeline like this, uh, they don't have to be you know, different versions of the same piece of data. That was just the case with our array. They can be also just arbitrary values that happen to be of the same type. So pretty cool. And every time you get notified, you have the latest data that you want, and uh, you need to decide what you want to do with it. So in our array table view example, uh, what do we want to do? How do we want to react to those uh, new pieces of data? Well, it can be as simple as just calling table view reload data, and that will be enough, right? Every time there is a change, we don't, uh, you know, we don't worry who does the change or how does that change happen. We just know there was a change. We have the latest value, so we just need to react uh, and uh, reload the data view. So every time there is a new data, we will uh, update a table view, and we move mentally to defining behaviors. Right? You define a single behavior here in this example, which is I want to show this array in this table view on screen. And you just leave Rx Swift to observe your data model, uh, detect the events that you want to react to, and you leave it to execute your behavior anytime 
there is a relevant event. So you just move to defining behaviors and let ArcSwift uh, execute them asynchronously for you. And so this is how our array observable look like plotted over a timeline. We started with uh, some contents in the array. It changed over time. We were doing um, different reactions to it. It was all great. And it was the same piece of data. We just uh, received its discrete values as it changed over time. But as we said, those can be also different values. They can be not have to be the same uh, piece of data. They can be just, for example, in this observable of numbers, this can be just random numbers or you know, some predefined sequence. Um, it, doesn't really, it doesn't really matter uh, what kind of um, pieces of data those are. And the data that the observable emits can be also of a more complex type. It can be a custom structure like this one. It has a CG point member and an integer number uh, inside and maybe represents um, user interaction on screen. You know, somebody clicked somewhere, um, and now my observable can emit those events as they happen. And I can decide what to do with them. In a drawing program, I can be very well listening about those and maybe drawing some lines in response to that. Uh, but that's pretty, pretty simple, because you will define one behavior and we'll let Rx2 execute it for you uh, each time there is a, a relevant event. And um, if you look at these values, how they are plotted over the timeline here, you know, those look pretty much like the built-in collection types in Swift, don't they? They're all of the same type, and they're uh, plotted over a certain order. The only difference is that they happen asynchronously. So these values are being appended to the collection asynchronously. But Rx allows you to treat them as a plain old collection. You can just map the elements as they're being added. You can count them. You can um, filter them. You can map and flat map them, and all, this, uh, all that jazz, which is, uh, in certain cases, very great to do. For example, let's have a look at a classic example with ArcSwift, a, a nap, a single screen app that uh, has a search field, you can enter a repo name, and they will go look up GitHub, find some matching results, and show them in a table view for you. Classic example. So <laughs> what do we do here? Well, um, we'll use RxCoco. It's a companion library to RxSwift. Uh, it provides extensions to many of the UI controls so that you can uh, have these pre-built observables that will emit um, the values out of them as you go. And so what we'll do? Well, we'll say, first of all, we want to uh, filter out all of the values that the text field emits that are too short. It will produce many irrelevant elements uh, with search results. We don't want that. So we can just say filter as we will do on any array. And so we want to react to any elements that are not matching this pattern. And we can do more things. We can just change them one after the other, as you can see from the error in there. We can also filter all of the elements that are happening too close to each other. So if the user knows part of the name of the repo and they type it very fast, we don't we need to uh, shoot a web request for all of these intermediate values. Dbounce automatically will detect if events are happening very fast and will just take the last value of those. It's a pattern that you will see later on uh, is used and is very handy uh, in asynchronous programming. Um, what else? Well. Now we have filtered all the values that we don't care about. We can do something else. We can say, we'll take the string and we'll make a URL request with it because we want to have a URL request to ask GitHub for results. Very simple. When we build a URL out of the string and we build a URL request, we can say it's finally time to uh, ask GitHub, what are the repos you have that match the search query? So, We'll do that by using a flat map. And flat map, in the case of RxSwift, pretty simplistically put, will allow us to wait kind of asynchronously for a bit of work to be done and then take the result back in that very case. So in that very case, we'll just wait for the uh, URL session to uh, shoot the URL request to GitHub and wait for the response back and give it back to us, the response, uh, some kind of JSON, most probably. So what do we do next? We have the JSON back from GitHub. 
we can dig in, find the relevant data, and turn it into a list of repo objects that we will then show on screen. Once we have the list, we can just bind it straight to a table view. RxWift knows how to do that. Or we can just provide an arbitrary code. What do we want to do with this data? And so you see that it's very simple. It's very linear. You have a start with your data, some events that trigger it. You can then process this data and decide what to do with it. And once you have the exact type and piece of data that you want, in the end, you can decide how to bind it to your UI or maybe to a database and so forth. So it's very, very linear. It's very easy to argue about the, the sequence uh, in which things are happening. Well, in my slide, you know, things are having more of a snake shape. But if we have a look at the code, you will see that things are very linear. So let's quickly have a look at that. Here is the code. We start with the search bar, just as in the flowchart. We will chain to that uh, or empty to handle nil values. And then we will continue with a filter, just as we said in the flowchart. We will continue with a debounce to uh, ignore all the events that are coming out too fast. And you know we change them because those are just methods on the observable class. So we can just call them one after the other, like so. The one produces the output that the next one expects as an input. And so it's very easy to uh, chain them like that. And we will continue with the map to build a request. With the flat map, uh, we will use the uh, URL session to make the request to the server and expect the response. We'll use map to uh, dig into the JSON and produce the list of repos. And finally, we'll bind it to a table view. And so there it is. The whole program is written in one screen. Normally, with Coco, you will have a delegate for the text field, a delegate, and a data source for the table view. URL session will work with some closures. But um, with Rx, that's kind of like a little bit easier to read, right? You don't have many methods spread around in different classes. You have this code that you can read top to bottom and understand exactly what it does. But since you're professionals now with Rx Swift, let's move on to more examples. This is the hardcore part of the, uh, of the talk. And I mean, it's kind of understandable now. If somebody takes 10 minutes to explain you what these things do, then it's not really very difficult. So let's have a look at a different example. So this is a different app that has two view controllers now. And the first one will display a list of, of repos. And the second one will be used to enter data and add repos to the list. So we have, in the top right corner, we have a plus bar item that users can tap show a new model vcontroller, enter some data, and then this new repo will be added to that list. Let's have a look at the code for the list vcontroller, how it's going to work. We're going to start by observing the, the right bar button item. It has a built-in extension, again, from Eric's Coco that will emit every time the user taps on the plus button. And now we can use the bounce. You know the bounce. What did it do? It kind of like ignored things that are happening very fast, quickly in, in succession. Why would we do that? Well, to handle unintentional double taps on the button. So for example, if the user taps by mistake two times, we won't open two view models controllers. We'll just open one. Then we'll continue with a flat map. We already saw flat map. It kind of allowed us to do some asynchronous work and wait for the result. And this is exactly what we're doing with the model view controller. We're fetching the controller from the storyboard. We're presenting it. It kind of like wait until it finishes and gives us some data back. Huh. OK. And so in the end, flat map will give us whatever the user entered into that other view controller. So we'll have this new uh, repo model, for example, that we can just, in the end, subscribe and uh, have this new object just added to the list that is displayed in the table view. Uh, pop the new view controller out, and there you go. So we didn't have to come up with a new protocol to define how these two view controllers are going to talk to each other. We didn't have to uh, you know, adopt the protocol in one of them. We didn't have to you know, bind them in any way. Observable gives us this universal way to, to talk in between classes. Very simple. And also, when you see this in the code, you can see very sequentially what is supposed to do in, in what sequence. And the final example this is a little bit more involved because it will uh, use also third-party libraries. So let's have a look at you know, what kind of code you can build when you uh, use a little bit of help from other people. 
So let's talk about this um, app that will fetch JSON updates from a server, uh, convert the JSONs into objects, store them on disk into a realm, and then we, on the main thread, we are going to be reading these objects from the disk and displaying them on table view. So um, I wrote this source control API class that does all the networking. You already saw how it's done. We won't really go over it again. And so I can really easily say I want to you know, process the JSON on a background thread, not to um, basically clog my main thread. Then I can say, again, each of these JSONs that I receive, I want to con convert to objects, so just a simple map. And since my class update that I defined also inherits from Realm's object, it's also actually a Realm object, I can just have these uh, and straight bind them into a, um, into a Realm, like so. And this is not built in. This is by a third-party library. But the win here is that these third-party libraries are tested and tried by a lot of people. So it's very easy to then define these very linear workflows, these very linear data flows. Here's the web. I switch threads. I process. I store. And that's it. It's very difficult to, to have a problem in here in this very, very simple code. And on the main thread, I want to bind create a data source um, object from this third-party library that will drive my table view, load the objects from the realm, and just use Rx to actually bind them. Say, these are the objects that I'm interested to show on screen. I want to bind them to my table view. And again, the big outtake from here is that the main win, the big win here, is not that the source code is shorter than usual. Because this code still exists somewhere, right? Like in the end, maybe the amount of code is maybe the same. The big one is that it's very sequential to read, and it's very easy to argue about in what kind of order this asynchronous code is happening. All right, so Rx Swift, what is it? It's a synchronous like asynchronous code, it has this functional aspect to it. You saw processing, filtering, crazy stuff. And it's also cross-platform, and it's tried and tested framework. There is Python, JavaScript, Kotlin, all kind of versions of it. And it's just fine. <laughs> all right. So um, final words. Uh, if you want to talk about Realm or Rx or anything at all, just uh, come fetch me. Um, if you are up for a new challenge, that's our jobs page. And uh, the sample codes that I just showed you, they're on my blog, rxmarn.com. If you go there, there's a .swift post. And you can just clone the repo and try them yourselves. Uh, play a little bit, see how they work. And with that, I thank you very much for having me today. Thank you.